Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nasher's 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today we are pleased to welcome writer and critic Lynn Tillman, who is here to share her work and discuss her experiences collaborating with artist Ronnie Horn, whose exhibition opens here at the Nasher today. You're all invited to join us upstairs near the Nasher store after today's conversation to enjoy a glass of wine and perhaps pick up a copy of Lynn Tillman's The Complete Madam Realism and Other Stories. Tillman's other fiction collections include Someday This Will Be Funny and This Is Not It, 22 stories responding to 23 contemporary artists' work. Among her novels, No Lease on Life was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1998, and American Genius, a comedy, was named one of the best books of the millennium so far by the millions in 2006. Her books of nonfiction and essays include The Broad Picture, the Velvet Years, Warhol's Factory, 1965 to 67, and Bookstore, The Life and Times of Jeanette Watson and Books and Co. Tillman's second collection of essays, What Would Lynn Tillman Do?, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism in 2014. Tillman writes a bi-monthly column titled In These Intemperate Times for Freeze Art Magazine. She is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Creative Capital Warhol Foundation grant for arts writing. Tillman recently completed her sixth novel, Men and Apparitions, in March of 2018. Oh, to be published in March of 2018. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Lynn Tillman's writing has appeared in many artist books and museum catalogs, including those of Jeff Koons, Barbara Kruger, Jim Hodges, Cindy Sherman, and Ronnie Horn, which is what brings her here today. In 1995, Tillman collaborated with Horn on text to accompany her exhibition, Gurgles Sucks Echoes, and today we will have the pleasure of hearing her read from the story, Ode to Lepetamine, which appeared in that catalog. After her reading, Tillman will join curator Lee Arnold in conversation, during which she has promised to tell us the story of how her collaboration with Ronnie came about. I'm looking forward to a lively and thoughtful conversation this afternoon, so please join me in welcoming Lynn Tillman. Minister-like, <laughs> ministering to a flock. <laughs> so I'm going to read the story that I wrote um, for Ronnie, uh, and then when I talk to Lee, I can tell you a little bit more about how it came about. And I just, I think I should show you, I, I don't know how well you can see it, but the kinds of... Um, images I was dealing with were, it's hard to see, but it's basically back, black background, gouaches with words on it. Sometimes a phrase, sometimes words that seemed um, juxtaposed to each other. Uh, so I, basically um, painted words um, on a black background. I shuddered, I seemed, I wanted, I tried, I loved, I proposed, I discovered, I knew, I studied, I dug, I needed, I imitated, I believed, I was, I realized, I wanted, I had, I became, I initiated, I gushed, I declared, I recorded, I recognized. I shuffled the deck. It was given to me, but I colored the cards. I dealt a hand, I threw the cards in the air. They fell on the floor. I picked them up in no special order. Failure hung around, pale, shapeless, ready. I fox fate, it's a daily routine. The wind's crazy, people walk, their umbrellas collapse. I can't fight the elements. I'm alone watching. Another ugly brown shoe was lying at the back door this morning. It matches the one that dropped there last week in the middle of a wet, dark, wild night. I wasn't waiting for the other shoe to drop. Then it did. My expectations are my own. Sometimes I share them. Sometimes I'm disappointed or surprised. Expectations are secrets. I play with mine, with them. It's a tricky business. Fourteen ugly brown shoes could be sitting at the back door tomorrow. Maybe there was a party. Everyone took off their shoes. 
The shoes fell from the roof and landed at the back door. If 14 bodies were lying there, dead, I'd need other explanations. A seance on the roof, they left their bodies behind. Or a mass suicide. I'd want to scream murder, call the cops, if death was skulking at my door. The shiny bags of garbage scattered in the backyard shimmer in the occasional sunlight. They sometimes look like a novel form of overground burial. The wind blows the bags everywhere. They've always been there. No one removes them. And I'm not going to touch them. I hate garbage, full of morbid ideas, crap. Now, a tall, thin guy is walking down the street, bent by the wind. He has to go to their, the post office and stand online, negotiate with people who hate their jobs. The way he sees it, it makes him a kind of human retrospective, writing letters, walking to the post office, being willing to stand and wait patiently. I engage with things as much as people, but I usually don't have fantasies about them. That probably isn't true. I watch television. I talk to it. It's not only talking to me. I'm not a sieve. It isn't either. Something else could be there, but that doesn't mean what's there isn't conclusive in its way. Inconclusive, too. This tall, thin guy liked envelopes. Envelopes enveloped, and usually words were incommensurate. He folded the letter into three equal parts the way nothing ever is, with definite edges, and stuffed it perfectly into the envelope. He sealed it up. He didn't hate licking glue. It reminded him he had a tongue like other animals who use it more. Le letters usually reach their destination, and unseen by others are read in private. Often the recipient doesn't really get the message. He knew that. It was a more controlled exchange, even with the interference of the post office. If it's not the post office, it's the telephone company. He couldn't control that. I don't come to any conclusions alone, even when I'm held in my own silly, irrelevant isolation. I think my isolation isn't solitary. It's a concoction. You're in it. So is he, she, they are too. You might have other ideas. You and I can appear to be interchangeable, easy to substitute, like pronouns, just as deceptive. I can believe, pretend I'm volunteering. I renew myself and things. If I, if it, if I tremble, it's a disease, nostalgia for the new. The thin guy wrote his longtime fiance. Quote, we share heaven and hell, hell's being right and wrong. You think I betray you by my indecision? It's how you think. What can I say? I'm vanishing, vanishing imperceptibly, unquote. A cranky magic act. The guy in the post office often disappeared behind the horizon between himself and others. He couldn't tell where the edge was for somebody else, for her. He pushed at her limits regularly. Cunning and silent, he demolished raw feelings, which arrived from a purple nothing, a needy non-place. They rushed out in clumps and wanted something to hang on to, finders, keepers, weepers. His words were held responsible. Now he was almost at the head of the line, worried about how he'd written her. He knew there was trouble ahead. He inevitably thought that a record stuck in its own ancient groove. Your cover songs and mine could be danceable, fast, slow, permeable, intransigent, opaque, accessible, beautiful, reluctant, funny, tough, different from what's in store. I want to go far and still stay in touch online. I don't have a dog, but I could walk one mentally if I decided to. No one would know I was just walking the dog. I can more easily do the laundry dramatically. In the laundromat, MTV's on. I see other people's clothes. I watch their mouths, eyes, how they fold their shirts. They notice me or don't. Smile, don't. Music caresses, pounds, a rhythm for everything. 
We're doing laundry in the same time, even if we're in different cycles. It's intimate and alien. Underpants flop around in dryers. That's anonymity. Signs hang on the attendant, a woman with sweat on her lip, annoyance on her tongue, acid in her stomach. I smile, tame her fury temporarily, and find out, pour in the bleach, go home, come back. He thought hard about what to say, how to put it, what shapes and colors to use when he tried to draw it out for her, even how to sign the letter. His effort exposed him. When Dorothy Parker was restless or lonely, she hung a one-word sign on her office door, men. Men walked in, thought it was the men's room. <laughs> she laughed, probably enlivened. He had never thought of that, women on his door. He wouldn't ever. He was surprised by what was immediate to him, but wasn't to other people. Same way around, then, then them to him, her to him. His jaw ached sometimes, explaining, and he hated the sound of his own voice, repeating himself in different settings. All the words in his universe taunted him, pictures multiplied forever in a series of mirrors. Even his reasoning was an image of itself feeding back. He was often, he was now, frightened for no reason. Outside, the wind blew indifferently. I change, don't, can't, have habits, am a habit. Want to make everything flip into another register, can't find the register. Someone I knew once worked at the reception desk at Claridge's. A man called up and said, there's a bomb in the hotel. And my friend opened the hotel register and looked for the name and answered, I'm sorry, there's no Mr. Abom in the hotel. <laughs> then he hung up. Later he realized it was a bomb threat. You try to reach me with reflections and illuminations, and I might not find what's evident to you. It's scary, this strangled distance between us, worrying about agreeing to agree, even about the terms of agreement. Something may be avoided in the contract. It may be implicit, elusive, but necessary. Sometimes I think that's all I can do, leave room. I build a room, I paint it, wallpaper it, furnish it, sleep in it, leave it, return to it, hope the room's still there. There's litter in it. I don't mean to return to garbage, but there's a lot of waste in my life. The guy was staring at a man in the post office who had 20 packages to mail and was holding up the line. A robber stealing time. At least he was next. He wondered if his letter was to her or for her or for someone else or for no one. He glanced back at the long snake of people with envelopes in their hands. Their vulnerability was on display. In that instant, he understood that a letter stands for something which has many letters in it. He wasn't sure if he was standing for himself and others or not. In the 19th century, a French performer named Le Petomaine farted for the public. He set his farts on fire, too, to give the audience a good show, an all-fractory night on the town. I have a picture of Le Petomain, ass sticking out, long, unlit wooden match in his hand. There must be a slit or opening in his trousers so he won't get burned. Hell of an entertainer. I wonder how he got the idea to go public. The guy listened to his stomach growl. At home, he let his body go, heard it compose a soundtrack, groans, sighs, moans, farts. He took painful, heavy breaths. He belched, chomped, chewed, slurped, smacked. No one compared slurps, belches, and groans, the beauty of life's secret, disgusting moments. His turn finally came. The postal worker he liked whispered, did you hear about the crash? Everyone was killed. If weirdness was usual, expected, I'd be forced to think on my feet and sitting down, make things up on the spot, dialogue, ways to walk, look, relationships. Nothing would correspond to anything for long. In a private arena, I'd have my own agenda. I wouldn't hurt anyone. See, I'm walking to the point along the edge where a fantasy of doing whatever I like and a drive to be liked compete. I'm not unique, so I don't have to worry. 
But in the present, I can't decide how many people I should speak to. The guy shook his head, just grunted to the postal worker who had whispered about the devastating crash. Strangers share the grotesque. A shadow crossed over the envelope. It was the postal worker's hand. But the guy felt darkness, a gap in the middle of his brain. She could have been killed on that flight. It was possible. Maybe he wanted her to die. He enjoyed the fantasy and tasted the sensation, bittersweet loss. Anguish and relief played a wistful song in him. He mailed the letter. He wouldn't know how beautiful flesh was, he realized, in, until he couldn't touch hers anymore. He couldn't know how beautiful flesh was. He recalled all of this and more, and he wrote her again and again, I can't, I won't. He invented a virtual reality game, a funeral home and cemetery for love. He stole and was stolen from. He deceived and was deceived. Don't try to contact me, she wrote back, ever. She thought he was crazy. I listened to Archbishop Desmond Tutu on the radio. He admits sheepishly, I love to be loved. I'm amazed by how many ways there are to go and how many dead ends. I can't try everything I want to. I'm improvising, everything's provisional. By now, the thin guy was such a wreck, his gums were bleeding. He finished work at the insurance company. He locked the doors, turned on the burglar alarm, looked down the street, and glanced warily at some other men who stared vacantly at him. He turned his back. He saw the ocean, sullen and gray and green. The gray sky was perpetually monotonous. Then the ocean roared. A huge flock of birds, thousands of black marks, dark ideas streaked across the sky. He watched them swirl and dart. They flew in unison. They broke away from each other. They swelled and dropped and swooned. They rushed, scrambled, and took their shape again. Then they abandoned it and, se abandoned it and separated. They went on and on. He wondered why they did that. Things never total up. They never stay still. Yesterday morning, a man with a red nose and a face cut from too many close shaves removed the shiny bags of garbage from the backyard. He had to climb through a window to get outside because the door wouldn't open. It wasn't locked, but it was stuck. When he couldn't get the door open, he cursed it. Then he turned and shot me a creepy, even sinister half-smile. He said, I don't know what you're doing, but you've jinxed this place. I didn't say a word. If that's what he thinks and wants to think, let him. There are a million other explanations, but he must like the idea, be invested in it. It's not my bank, but I could begin to appreciate, investigate his characterization, throw a party for it. A bad recognition is better than none at all. Distorted mirrors still reflect an image. I have my illusions, he has his. I would stop celebrating loss if I could figure out what replaces it. The plumber has just left. He said he told the man with the red, month, no, with the red nose months ago that the door was stuck, the faucet, faucet needed to be fixed, the toilet seat was broken. I didn't jinx the place. It was already jinxed. I arrived, saw the damage, demanded repairs, got them. There are promises and mistakes everywhere. It's hard to tell them apart. I keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that. It's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> I think um, in some ways I'd like to begin with the idea of this text that you wrote was intended for an exhibition catalog. Yeah. Which normally an exhibition catalog, at least those that I've been asked to write for, you focus on the work, you find some way to talk about the work, enlighten the reader about some aspect of the work. And yet your text is 
really, you don't, maybe it's not so apparent how it enlightens or even or relates it enlightens. Yeah, <laughs> to Ronnie Horn's work. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious when you were asked, uh, how did this collaboration happen? And then well, I have other questions, but let's start with that it one. It goes back um, when I was asked to, as many fiction writers are, or some fiction writers are, to write about art or an artist's work in the um, 1980s. Um, I decided that I would not put writing on the back burner and write, uh, I was not an art historian, not, I didn't get my PhD, <clears throat> knew something, thought about art, had film experience, and, but I didn't want to ape what art historians or art critics do regularly, and I respect that discipline highly, but I thought um, I wanted to bring what I do to the work. So I made a decision uh, not to write anything but stories, even for, um, uh, well, I have a character called Madame Realism, and in 1980, and I'd written one Madame Realism story at that point, and Kiki Smith had uh, illustrated, it was a little chat book that came out in 84. And in 86, Craig Owens, who was the, uh, one of the editors, um, senior editors at Art in America, asked if I'd write about um, at, um, Renoir for an, a big exhibition in Boston. And I decided, and it's a longer story, I decided to bring Madame Realism back. Because I said to Craig, you know, I'm, I'm not an art historian the way I'm telling you. And he said, we know that. You're a fiction writer. So I decided that this character, Madame Realism, would be the one who went to the exhibition and who wrote about it, in a sense, her point of view. And that allowed me to both give information about, I could mention some of the paintings, but I could also go off into certain kinds of reflections that art historians don't, don't make. I wanted writing to be um, foregrounded and not pay, not play in the back, be in the back seat mm -hmm. to that. So um, I don't know if this is technically a collaboration in that Ronnie and I didn't sit down and write this together or work on this together, but um, she showed me the gouaches and then I uh, got, uh, that were going to be in the exhibition in the catalog. And then I got some good color Xeroxes of them <laughs> and uh, tried to figure out how to write about somebody who's working with words as she was and phrases and using color. And so it, the way in which I began this uh, and I was then a writer in residence at the University of, um, at Sussex in Brighton, England. Uh, and so certain of those elements come in, like the ocean, because I would go look at the ocean and the birds and so on. And I was thinking about, and I often think about this, why did Ronnie do these? <laughs> you know, what was she trying to do? And, and these words like gurgle sucks echoes and others. And mm -hmm. some of that is referred to, uh, not necessarily directly, uh, but the <coughs> kinds of, um, it, it seemed to me like she was trying to utter the phrases that were unutterable, mm -hmm. that were not uh, communicated by people, that we didn't speak to each other mm -hmm. this way. And from that, I thought a lot about the idea of art and communication mm -hmm. and messages. And were these messages that Ronnie had uh, created? Were these, how was I to read these quite literally and then figuratively? So I took the stack, and as a way to get myself started, I took the stack of, I've never told anyone this actually, <laughs> I took the stack of uh, gouaches. Mm -hmm color Xeroxes, 
And to each one, I gave a, a pronoun and verb. So I would see a phrase, and I'd think, I want, or I need, or I danced, or whatever I did. And I did indeed throw the pages up in the air. I mean, I, I tried to get myself into a kind of fictive place with them. And that, that's how that began. But there was very much a sense of something she was saying something that could not easily be interpreted. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I look at the work that we have on view upstairs and the fact that they're all untitled, but they have subtitles that are quite lengthy. They're all excerpts from mm -hmm. literary texts that she's read. Mm -hmm. And you know, she's always adamant about saying there's no descriptive function of that. There's no real connection between the subtitle and the object. And in, and in many ways, I think by putting the untitled first, she's trying to distance the viewer from trying to make that connection. And it's interesting to think about how text functions in her works. So with these gouaches, it's very apparent how text functions. She's deconstructing it. She's using words right on the page. With her titles and subtitles, it's less apparent, but you're always getting some sense of how important literature is to her work. But I thought it was interesting that your text for this exhibition catalog, which normally should be a function of helping the reader understand the work, really was a way for you to help Ronnie just explore text. And I think she was, in a way, kind of excerpting your words and bringing them into her work, if that makes any sense. Well, I did this after she'd done the gouaches, mm -hmm. of course. I, I don't know if it helped anybody, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, and as I told you, I'm not sure if it's a successful story mm -hmm. or not. I mean, it's a pretty complicated story, uh, you know, using first person and third person, and mm -hmm. this, the eye, the narrator's eye, in a sense, looking at and studying this guy, this he who goes to the post office. and. Um, that the eye becomes an observer just as the eye is an observer to her work. And now this, the eye is an observer to, um, uh, to this man who's at the post office. And through that part of the fiction, the man, I could get to the point of, you know, Derrida said a letter always reaches its destination, but I always wonder, well, is it in time? <laughs> And if it's not in time, uh, how does that affect the message? And um, if it's, uh, how is it interpreted? I mean, tone is so important in reading somebody's letter. And of course, in a text, now everybody is texting. <laughs> Those of us who are writers and care about tone have a big problem <laughs> figuring out what is the tone. And it's as if things are toneless in text sometimes. And, People can sound much harsher, even in emails, the old-fashioned email, than, than they imagine they are. They're not thinking about, uh, should I have said but, or maybe it should be or, you know, there. That's something I think about all the time than other writers I know, so you spend much more time. <laughs> See, the phone is still easier in that way. You can <laughs> control your tone. Um, but. Um, I, people knew when they asked me by 1986 uh, that I, I was very deliberate um, in, I was not going to write a normal or the usual. And if you wanted me to write something, you would accept that it would be a story. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie has a great respect for literature. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what I don't know, and maybe you know, Lee, is how many, um, how many works she'd done with words before. Before 1994? Before 1994. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, it, 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 took me a long, it took me about six weeks to write this story. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went back to, and I, it was facts. This is how old this story. <laughs> it was facts to Ronnie. 
And Ronnie is a, a terrific writer herself. And uh, she wrote back, and she was very happy with it. She said, There's, there are two sentences I don't think you need in this. <laughs> and she was absolutely right. I said, you're right. You know? And this is a pretty complicated text to be uh, an editor of. And actually, most people really can't edit fiction, but that's so that's another <laughs> story. Um, and then when I got back to New York, and she was in New York, I went to her studio. And I, again, thanked her for commissioning me, telling Matthew Mark's gallery, that's who she was with then, uh, to, to invite me to do this. And my pay for it was $2,500, which oh. seemed like really great. I mean, writers don't get much money <laughs> for things. Uh, not that many of us make a, a good mo good money from it, and uh, she I, I, I thanked her for that, and she said, "How long did it take you?" I said, "About six weeks." She said, "I can do one of those in less than a day or a oh, week." I mean, she was sort of <laughs> astonished because the the the, the medium writing. Um, compared with doing a gouache. And obviously, the materiality of gouache itself requires a certain kind of speed. You know, I've done some work with watercolors years ago. I studied painting. I um, sort of took all my electives at Hunter College with Ron Gorchoff and Doug Olson. And um, so uh, it was kind of escape from the English department. But <laughs> and it was, really. but. Uh, so she was astonished. Ronnie was astonished that I thought $2,500 was <laughs> great work for six weeks. But <laughs> great pay. I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about where you were at that point in 1994 and, and why an artist might approach you. Um, what's your history in, in the arts, and, and how does that inter intersect with your own writing? Well. I, I was living in Europe in the 70s after college, and I got, I was always writing. I wanted to be a writer from the age of eight. That was just, that's what I wanted to be. And I knew I was going to be that, but I had a lot of insecurity. I couldn't show anybody anything I was writing. Uh, terrified, absolutely terrified. So when I left college, um, I knew I couldn't be in New York City. I, I grew up uh, in the suburbs, Woodmere, Long mm -hmm. Island. But I went to school, luckily, in uh, Hunter College. And that was Park Avenue and 68th Street. I was right in the middle of the city. Central Park was my campus, you know, and it, 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 was, it was right for me. I couldn't stand b being in a real campus. I tried it, and I, I hated it. But, um, and, so I got into making film as a way of not showing anybody <laughs> that I was really <laughs> writing. Experimental film and showed film. And so when I came back from Europe to New York, I had this film background and was doing stuff in that. And, uh, I, I, and from that, this was the late 70s. In 1978, that's when I met Barbara Kruger. There was this incredible sea change going on within the art world. And it was very exciting, extremely exciting. And um, it was women forward. Uh, there, you know, Cindy Sherman and Barbara Kruger and Louise Lawler and um, Adrian Piper. I mean, it was just an extraordinary. And they were great. I mean, they were, you know, Robert Longo and Richard Prince and everybody else. It was a, it was a fertile moment. And uh, it was a good moment for me to come back. And then I started hanging out with artists. And um, I was visually, I, I think, oriented from an early age. My father was a, a fabric designer. And um, my mother was an amateur painter. But he designed um, uh, fabrics and manufactured them with his brother. And so the idea of material, you know, fabric and what it was made of and how it looked was very important to me, what it feels like, like, mm -hmm. like cotton. You know, really <laughs> um, and then uh, I guess at that time, people by the, 
Oh, by the, particularly mid 80s, late 80s, I think a lot of artists were looking for other ways for people to write about their work. And one of the things that is interesting to me about the artists, I know many of them, is this fear of words. Mm. So Ronnie is unique. I mean, she's not the only one who works with words. Obviously, Barbara Kruger works with words, and Richard Prince writes jokes, and uh, other, <laughs> other people. But she is, in a way, I think, I was thinking about this uh, for the last couple of weeks. She's, she did a spin on text and image mm -hmm. that no one else was doing. Uh, there were a lot of text and image people even, uh, you know, going back some before her uh, within um, minimalism, but uh, by the late 70s into the 80s, uh, there was a lot of that. But she never, and she puts words, when she started doing the Emily Dickinson, mm -hmm. that's the first time I was so aware of her use of um, appropriated texts. These are vertical, vertical sculptures that lean against the walls. They're kind and of they're long very, rods. They're narrow rods, yeah. exactly. And she embeds the words of Emily Dickinson on, on, directly onto these. And I think they're frequently in aluminum. Um, and I, White, I, black letters. Yes, exactly. And it's such a turn on what, I mean, I know how inspired and, uh, she was by Donald Judd. Mm -hmm. But it's such a turn on that minimalism because bringing words in, and this is where I think uh, the work is inflected by uh, feminism mm -hmm. also. The, the question of, ha of, of making minimalism speak <laughs> in a way that it hadn't before mm -hmm. um, was one of the exceptions uh, that she brought into the to the art world, and it, it, the way in which she did it, uh, I think, uh, I mean, you know, Jenny Holzer was working with words also, uh, appropriated texts early on anyway. Um, but the way in which she did it uh, is, is um, different from anyone else, and I, I think it has to do with going to the literary text mm -hmm. and not having it um, the reason she doesn't title her works, I think, uh, mostly, uh, is that she doesn't want to contain them. Mm -hmm. uh, words can often uh, so describe the picture. You know, uh, if you don't have dialogue in a film, you'll see the film very differently than if suddenly the characters speak. And I, I, she didn't want that, I don't think. Uh, mm -hmm. She wanted to use words, but have them in a way. I like text and image, but keeping them separate. Right. I, I read that she, uh, in one interview she did, where she called them, uh, her use of um, titles, uh, entrances mm -hmm. to her work. And that is, that is a way, I, I tend to think they're quite separate. I think you could look at them and look at the work and not see any um, uh, cohesion. Yeah, I've read she's, she often dislikes when the title is necessary for understanding the work. Yes. And for her, for Ronnie, especially experience is such a huge aspect of her work. So she never expects to have any control over anyone's experience. In fact, she's more interested in the plurality of experiences that can be, you know, any individual has their own experience and that for her is very important. And she, she uses um, language or uh, things that we do with language, we as writers do with language. For instance, you can think about her work, um, you know, where she has one object in a room and then the same object in the next room. Mm -hmm. Now that's either a pun a visual pun, or it's some kind of ironic gesture. Um, I mean, you can think of it in many other ways, but if you're thinking in terms of grammar or language, 
Uh, yes, it's an experience, but it's a, people talk about it as doubling. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it actually, there's a negating too. There's a kind of ironic way in which it's, now you see it, now you don't. Uh, it's a curious uh, crossing out, um, putting in, crossing out, very, uh, and many have, the, prob the problem with writing about artists who are as well known as, as um, Ronnie uh, is that if you're interested as a writer in the form of writing and in the use of language, and you, uh, you have to try as much as possible, I do, not to read what other writers, uh, art historians have said about it. Yeah. I just finished um, a long essay on Ankawara. Uh, there's a Glenstone Foundation uh, outside Washington, D.C. Where Western. Ronnie has a current show. Yes, where Ronnie's show is up currently, yeah. and they made a beautiful catalog. Yeah. Uh, they asked me to write on on Kawara. Now, the, the, the truth is about any writer, for the most part, I don't claim any expertise, but I did a lot of looking at Kawara and uh, I visited with his widow and his son-in-law who runs, have, they run the estate together, saw his studio which has been kept intact and he didn't die that long ago. Um, but Ankawara has been written about in a particular way over and over again. And uh, I wanted the facts mm -hmm. and uh, about when a piece appeared or when he did this or that. But how do you approach an artist who's been written about so much? And that's very hard, but as, it really is hard. Mm -hmm. um, but as a fiction writer, what I call upon is that um, I, I can concentrate on different areas. So for instance, in the one on Ankawara, one of his pieces, one of his postcard series is I Am Still Alive. Uh, his first was I Got Up, and then it's at 10 a.m. or <laughs> something. And then I, I concentrated on, after I'd written something about I Got Up, uh, I concentrated on the still in I Am Still Alive. And I became very interested in that and what kinds of narratives that produces in the reader of this. And he sent these as telegrams. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in casing his whole work, I think is the fact that he was born in 32 uh, in Japan. And like, uh, like Richter, like Peter Dreyer, like o Roman Opalka, they were all children of war who about the same age when the war ended. And I, I, so there was I, was, I was thinking about context, history, but I was also thinking about his work as altogether as kind of forming, uh, comprising a novel, mm. pictures and words and numbers. So I, I had to, I, 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 I had to try to pull from myself something that um, was in my, writing mind. And that's what I did with Ronnie, mm -hmm. too. So I was thinking about forms of communication, secret language, uh, people not understanding, uh, uh, people trying to communicate. Uh, I, and I did, I tried to flip, play with that as much as I, as much as I could. Mm -hmm. Do you read anything? What are you What are you reading these days? What, or what are you influenced? Well, actually, by? I'm reading a, a friend's a poet. He's just written his first novel, um, and it's called MacArthur Park. Uh, Andrew Bjerben. So I'm reading that for uh, to give him a blurb. It's very interesting. He also writes art criticism. Um, but are there any writers who you learned from by, by reading their books, and who would they be? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, it's funny. People, when, when you ask a writer that, usually they pull out these big names. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I think very early on, the biggest influence on me was listening to Ray Charles hmm. when I was uh, eight years old. Um, because uh, his, to me, rhythms, and if, if you were hearing rhythms in writing, and it, uh, is part of the way I hope to keep a reader involved, because it's not, there's some stories of mine or novels that have more of a sense of plot, sometimes less, and so on. So how do you keep a reader engaged? And the thing that I heard with, with Ray Charles was intonation. I didn't know this at the time, but I was so interested in how the word and the sound and the rhythm all came together. It was poetry, you know. I'd, and dancing to it and moving to it. And there's got to be a reason my husband's a bass player. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's still very, very important to me. And then, you know, I think I've had various I influence. Uh, Jane Bowles uh, wrote one, a great American writer, uh, wrote only one novel called Two Serious Ladies. It came out in 1943. And if you haven't read it, is still in print. It comes back and it disappears. And she, her husband is better known, Paul Paul Bowles. Uh, but this is this is a off the charts unusual novel. And I wanted to write a novel. My first novel is called Haunted Houses, and um, it begins with an epigraph from H. D. H. D. the poet. Uh, Hilda Doolittle. She was an American imagist, and she'd been in analysis with Freud uh, in Vienna in the early 30s. And Freud is a big influence on me. So, um, and it's uh, it's a novel called uh, sorry, it's a book called Tribute to Freud. It's a it's about her analysis with Freud, and it's beautifully written. And in it, she writes, "We are all haunted houses." Hmm. And so that's where Haunted Houses came from. Little did I know that then that many other people had written books with Haunted Houses or <laughs> Haunted House, but including Virginia Woolf. Uh, I mean, I, re I hadn't read that. Virginia, I wouldn't have used it otherwise. But yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, Jane Bowles, I felt, gave me permission to write about girls in a very different way uh, in haunted houses, uh, because her novel, Two Serious Ladies, is about those two serious ladies. <laughs> and uh, there's nothing else like it in modernist literature. And um, it's hysterically funny and very tragic and wild, a totally wild book. So she was very important to me. Mm -hmm. And then I can pull out all the people that you, know, well, you, you would imagine. It's interesting that you mentioned Ray Charles, because I was speaking with Ronnie earlier this week and working up the nerve to ask her that question that all art historians want to know is, who do you look at or who do you enjoy? Who are the artists you're looking at or may have mm. been influenced by? And her response was, you know, Art, I don't look at so much art anymore. I'm more influenced by writing and literature and things that I'm reading. But I have to say that I'm very interested in improvisational language and especially um, scat. So Ella Fitzgerald um, and other um, jazz musicians and, and the way that they can just make these utterances and improvise and all following along with that rhythm and that musical quality. So. It's interesting it that is. you both had this kind of affinity for music and yeah. finding a way to literature and art through music. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. And also, I just loved, from when I was eight, loved writing little compositions. <laughs> and I'm the youngest in my family by six and nine years. I have two older and So I think you know, part of it is, this is obviously a retrospective <laughs> comment. <laughs> you know, you're born into a family that's already constituted, and people are speaking, and you can't speak yet, and even if you do speak, no one listens to you, you know. <laughs> um, and everyone's very vociferous and so on, but when I got to writing, I could, you know, have my own little sp space, or, um, and I think that was just 
you know, the greatest feeling I'd, I'd ever had. And so you just mentioned that the Julie Bowles felt like she gave you permission to write about girls, but your newest book, is novel, about, is yeah, about... Yeah, that, that it's <laughs> called Men and Apparitions. I, I wrote, I do write stories sometimes from the point of view of men. I wrote a novel, Cast in Doubt, that was my... Uh, third novel, and that's from the point of view of a 65-year-old gay man in the first person. But I hadn't um, written a younger man or a younger heterosexual man in a novel. And so this one um, was hell to write, and <laughs> very hard. And it's called Men and Apparitions. And it came about because uh, for years, I've been hearing, as you've all been hearing, the term, the, the idea, we live in a glut of images. You know, we've been living with that notion for 30 years at least. And I thought, well, how do you narrate that? How would I write a novel based on that idea? And uh, so that was the first. And then I thought, well, who can tell this story? And um, I went to graduate school in sociology toward a PhD, and I got all my credits, but I never did my, the rest of it, because I just really wanted to read other stuff. And I read a lot of anthropology and um, Clifford Geertz, uh, James Clifford, um, uh, oh, Irving Goffman, uh, ethnomethodologist. Uh, I mean, work that was really important to me, apart from other um, things in graduate school. So, um, so that was in my mind, this idea of working with a cultural anthropologist as my. So then I, I wrote a short story for a catalog um, that was about, um, it was called Shoot the Family. And Brian, uh, oh no, who, who put it together? He's now in London, but he used to be in LA. It's going to come to me. Anyway, Ralph, Ralph Rugoff. Um, and uh, I wrote this short story for, shoot the, for the Shoot the Family. And it was all photographers who were shooting their family, like Mitch Epstein, um, who did a book called Family Business. And, and uh, I realized I had a character there. And I used him. He was a cultural anthropologist. And then I made him an ethnographer of family photographs. Uh, and as a kid, I used to take down a projector all by myself and show myself the family movies that my father had shot. Uh, and I would sit alone in our living room in the suburbs, you know, projecting onto a wall. Uh, I think I just wanted to see who these people were, you know, <laughs> before I came into the, to the world. So I've been interested and go through the family photographs again and again. And uh, so I decided that this guy, Ezekiel Stark, 38 years old, uh, would be my protagonist and be in the first person. And then I started thinking about his relationship to being a man. And so I was bringing ethnography and photography and what, the, what an image is and there's some historical stuff and about a relationship in his family, a relation in the 19th century. Um, Clover Hooper Adams, who was married to Henry Adams, and she was a photographer, died about 1883, I think it was, 73 but was a professional photographer for the last three years of her life, which was very, very odd for a woman of her class. And she knew Henry James. So there was just a great, rich vein for me to, to work with. So he's related to her through his mother's uh, side. So there was that material. But then I decided I really wanted to do an ethnographic study uh, through my character, Ezekiel. Um, and so I sent an email to about 30 guys I know <laughs> who were all born uh, under the sign of feminism or after the women's movement or their mothers were feminists or, you know, they'd be anywhere between 25 and 45 years old now. 
and uh, ask them questions like, open-ended questions like, how are you different from your father? Uh, what's you, you know, what do you expect of women? What do you think they expect of you now? And so on. And I, it was a very select group. I mean, I was sending it to extremely intelligent guys, many of whom were artists or, or writers or just people I knew to be thoughtful. And um, I got back all this incredible, these incredible answers. So there's a part of the book which comes after the sort of narrative part of the book, although it's part of the novel. Mm -hmm. And that, that's called Men in Quotes, because there are quotes from these men. Uh, and Zeke is, he's made this ethnographic study of them, and he interpolates. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's going to be photographs, but just scanned. Mm -hmm. uh, family photographs, found photographs in the book. So look for that in March 2018. Yes, please do, yes. I think if you're okay, we might open it up for any questions or comments. Well, if there aren't any questions, I know everybody's gonna, well, here we go. Okay. Excuse me? Oh, for the Renoir. It was very popular, extremely long, long lines. <laughs> yes, Jeremy. Yeah, just a question about your thoughts about this body of work. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that is distinctive is that these are the, margin, the largest, heaviest uh, works that she's made uh, in this material period. Yes. Uh, and that level of physical ambition yeah. it seems remarkable to me. And I'm sorry if you have any thoughts about that as it pertains to her and her work overall. Well, it does relate to her interest in water, mm -hmm. uh, because it appears yeah. that that glass is water, and you want to go up. And, <laughs> and when you go up, it's it. <laughs> impermeable, of, of course. Uh, and in some sense, because of the color that she's using, they, they, while they're massive, they look light. They are light mm -hmm. in, that, in the colors, the pastel. She's not using dark, dark colors. Um, uh, so that's a curious, again, that's a, a sort of anomaly of them. While they're massive, they're, they're light in color, so they're lighthearted, which we don't usually think of uh, massive shapes being, if you think of, um, oh, who's the guy working in steel? Richard Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Richard Sarah. I think, um, I think they're amazing. I think that they're all in the same room is interesting, too. So it's not, um, it's not that sense of irony or well, doubling in a way. Actually, um, there is a little bit of that going on. Oh. The, there's one work is con consists of two parts, oh. and that's and they don't look identical. You know, they are different colors within the, that room. Yes, upstairs. Um, so there is that. She does this quite often, where she gives two pieces or two parts this one title, and she makes them one work. Mm -hmm. And I also think you know the two clear sculptures upstairs, to me, are are playing with that. Um, idea of sameness and difference because their chemical makeup is identical. They're just clear glass, mm -hmm. um, and the way they were made is identical. Everything about them appears identical, but their molds were all, were unique. So there are subtle differences. So differences, yes. But it yeah. that's something that I think is a recurring theme in her work, which is um, pairing of objects or this doubling effect to get the viewer to really think about. Because it's when you put two of something up you start to really look at it and discern how are they different or, or how are they the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, the question interests me because uh, for a number of reasons, um, in a way, I, I don't have an answer about why she went to this massive, each one is what, 10,000 pounds, mm -hmm. five tons? 
Um, I do think that sculpture has been primarily a man's game. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there, the impulse to play that game, you know, the, the, the massiveness. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Richard Serra for, mm -hmm. for a reason. I mean, you're always confronting these enormous steel um, objects. And uh, Jim Hodges, who's also a wonderful artist, he uh, did a steel piece, but there were all cutouts in it. So you get the massive, but also this lace-like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, I thought, a retort to Richard Serra. <laughs> so, um, so Ronnie, Ronnie's entry into this, I, 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 we can speculate. I can speculate. Um, they seem graceful to me. There's, uh, the, they, they're beautiful to me. I, even though they're massive, they don't, um, I think because of the use of glass and because you feel that there's some relationship to water, um, she's con containing some, these are containers. Uh, and whereas when she did the Thames River, that mm -hmm. was uncontainable. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that figures, um, I don't think anything is ever just a formal decision mm -hmm. in anybody's work, yeah. Well, since you're referring to the physicality and the massiveness, can you explain to us the process of the making? Sure, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's a very labor and time intensive process. Just one of those works takes up to 10 months to complete. Um, and it starts by making the mold, which the mold is, comprises uh, cast fire brick that um, is then held in place by a cast iron collar, which is giant, goes over the sides of the mold. And that mold is lined, and then molten glass is poured very, very slowly at a constant rate and a constant temperature. And that pouring takes about eight days. Just, and that's, that's intent, I mean, it needs to be that slow to allow for the air to escape before the glass settles. If you pour too quickly, you'll, you'll result with bubbles, inclusions, um, any, any point where that air is trapped and can't get out, it'll find a way out eventually, and it'll usually do that through cracking or something. So it takes about eight days to pour the glass, and then once the glass is poured, the mold and the glass go into an annealing oven, which is just a term um, for a cooling oven. And there it stays for a period of 10 months. So it takes about 10 months for that um, glass to completely cool. So when the mold is removed, and if everybody's been upstairs, you'll see that the sides have this frosted appearance, and they even have a subtle texture. That's where the glass has taken the shape of the mold. Um, anywhere the glass has come into contact with the mold, it's taken that appearance, whereas the s top surfaces have that luscious, you know, sensuous liquid appearance. When they're pouring, so if it takes eight days, obviously they're not doing it, or, they, or are they doing it continuously? Continuously, You have different yes. people working who are doing that. Ah. I don't know if it's hand poured, but. <laughs> well, whatever, yeah. I mean, probably not. Cer yeah. Certainly not with a, a creamer or something. But um, so do you know the motion that they're using? I mean, does it? I've it's, never it's... heard anything about motion, but maybe there's a glass pouring expert in the audience who could tell us. But um, I don't know if there's any motion involved. I think it's just a very slow process of pouring to ensure that that molten glass so the, is very evenly so dispersed. So that liquid would be slowly filling. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So then the temperature of the glass has to be the same, so they have to kill to keep heating the glass? Yes. And she pours, or? No, the glass is kept at a temperature, and the fire brick helps keep the lower part, you know, maintain the temperature throughout while the glass is being poured. So it's not in a kiln while it's being poured. Uh, it's just, I don't know where they pour it, but it's not in a kiln of any kind. It's just molten glass being poured in, 
and then that being transferred into the cooling oven where it cools down. So interesting, because I just saw her work at Hauser and Wirth before mm -hmm. I came, and um, there were four, mm -hmm. but with very different out, outward appearance. Interesting. Uh, uh, but there was a lot of um, writing kind of work, and yes. she was working with paper that she had cut up, words on it, very laborious. Mm -hmm. Uh, work, but uh, I think and she, large in scale too. I no, can't remember. No, no, just don't know. Uh, like a piece of like, drawing paper about mm. that size, and time-consuming. Yeah, she'll make work. drawings and then completely cut them up, cut them up and yeah. then collage them essentially. And back so together. different from yeah. these these sh shapes. And one of the things that I appreciate about Ronnie's work is that she's working with different materials and uh, different approaches and something could be cut up and another thing could be absolutely incapable of being mm -hmm. cut. I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, in writing, I'm always trying to write different. My novels, uh, were you to read any of them, one to the other are quite different from uh, each other and uh, that's, the challenge to me, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, the challenge to me, I wondered what that was, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. The challenge to me is um, to find something else to do and another way to do it. And so I think, Ronnie, I mean, we all have our themes or uh, obviously I identity, fluidity, things like that are very important to, to Ronnie, I mean, p taking, pictures of the Thames is sort of like a, a, a portrait of fluidity, mm -hmm. something, and she's, the, she is very, very interested in things that change. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously molten glass, glass then change, but then it, it's so massively the, sta the same. And what people may not realize, I didn't, but glass as a material is described as an amorphous liquid meaning it's never a solid, it's never a liquid, but somewhere in between. That's just what glass is. So while they look just solid, they're in fact imperceptibly in motion, which again, I think plays into uh, Ronnie's interests in perception, but also identity and how identity can be, the mutable qualities of identity and how that can be changeable and also internal and out external. And external, I like that. Perceptions. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there aren't any other questions, I think we could all go upstairs to the gift shop, have a glass of wine, purchase a book, get it signed. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank, Lynn. Thanks, this has Lee. been really Thank special. You. Thank you.